I'm now excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is Tom Luganville, who covers all things football for ESPN. I feel like that's really the only way you can describe what you do. Um, I, I know you're busy with with UFL things this yeah. spring. If ESPN said, all right, Luke's, we, we need you to just cover a summer football league for us too. Is it safe to say that you'd be on board with that as well? Oh, absolutely. There is no question about it. And I kind of joke because I have a special place in my heart for, for the spring professional football deal because there needs to be a spot for it. The players need it. The NFL needs it, quite honestly, whether they want to admit it or not. And, you know, having been involved in – what was the second iteration of the old World League from the early 90s, but they ended up calling it NFL Europe, which returned in 95. And I was a part of that with Amsterdam. Then went on to be a part of the first XFL in 2001 um, in Los Angeles. And, you know, I've coached in the Arena Football League and, and I've been involved in the, in the NFL. And then having the opportunity as a broadcaster to come back in 2020, where quite honestly, man, they made a bunch of awesome fixes to the to the 2020 XFL. And had the pandemic not happened, I think that thing would have been off and running. And so then, you know, the USFL comes along, the XFL comes back in 2023. They merged to make the, what is now the UFL. And I've actually gone to our company. I'm like, listen, you're going to have to put people on this that don't care about it. I care about it. Like, it means something to me. I'm invested in it. And so... You know, I started out in professional football, was raised the son of a college coach, and now I've been involved in the high school, college, and pro game for much of the last 20 years. So it's a really good blend of all three. And what makes it fun, dude, is going through the rosters and, like, seeing somebody like Ruben Foster, Jarek Guarantano. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. All of the Dalen Mack seeing all of these guys on these UFL rosters and realizing, oh, I remember seeing that kid at a Houston camp when he was 14 or he was 15, you know, those types of things are always kind of fun. It's a bit nostalgic. You know, it's, I bet that a lot of, a lot of people right now are wondering like, Hey, this new kickoff thing that's happening in college football yeah. or like in the NFL, the even NFL. more so that's, it feels like it's probably going to happen in college football too. And there's kind of, you know, figuring out what it's going to look like. You're like the perfect person for all things, like, hey, will the, can this possibly work because of all the different levels of football that you've looked at? That should just be that you should add that title. Just be like, like sit into all these meetings and be like, hey, this this thing, this new policy. Like we're talking about the two minute warning in college football. Yeah. Like if that can work, I think you'd be just perfect for that. <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, I've been involved in a lot of leagues where the rules are unique. You know, for example, the very first XFL, we could actually have one receiver in forward motion. It was like arena football, but outdoors, but not like the CFL, because in the CFL, they can all do it, right? And then we had, you could actually block a defensive lineman with a receiver or a tight end coming downhill at him. Now, imagine the violence of that collision, which we would <laughs> never allow now, right? You were penalized if you punted the ball out of bounds. You were penalized if you go for a fair catch. And some of those rules still exist. I mean, we... The, the, the current state of the UFL, and really the USFL and the XFL the last couple of, of years, have placed an emphasis on setting the offense up for success, you know, penalizing a ball being kicked out of bounds, and then making the penalty be field position for the receiving team. Um, and I, 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 li I like those things. The thing about the kickoff return, and this is why the NFL has gone this direction, and it's ironic because the UFL, when they blended with the USFL and the XFL, they actually – came to an agreement to adopt what the USFL's return was, which is it's similar. And at the end of the day, I think it produces the same thing. And what is that? That is player safety, but still the excitement that a special teams play could result in points and at a bare minimum result in really good field position. That's, that's I think, the goal here. Because what everybody wants to do is eliminate you know, they've tried to eliminate the wedge, right? Then you had to have, if you were going to have a wedge, you had to stagger it. And, you know, they had all these little tweaks to avoid that 100-mile-an-hour collision. And at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do, right? So I think between the USFL and the XFL and now the UFL, they've tweaked it to the point where you, everybody wins, right? The players are safer. You get the excitement of the play. You've got field position offensively. You could – I mean, we had – my game this past weekend, I had St. Louis – I had St. Louis and um, 
and uh, why am I drawing a blank here? St. Louis and um, Memphis. And all four, first four possessions of the game, two for St. Louis, two for Memphis, all started on the plus side of the 50-yard line. Like, that's how big a part of the return game was. So that part of it's pretty cool. Let's talk some American college football. That is your bread and butter. Um, I don't know how much you had a chance to be able to, to see the guy that was a star of the weekend, Arch Manning, guy that we yeah. talked about in the open here. Uh, but the best moment so far of his college career uh, it was in that spring game, which, look, um, it's, it's significant because it came on the heels of, of a spring in which – Sark really praised his development and praised yeah. the, the the player that he's become as a redshirt freshman. For those who think that Arch is only this decorated and he only got those ratings as a recruit because of his last name, what would you say to those people? I would say that they have not watched him. They have not studied him. They don't know the intangible traits. They don't know the investment. Um, being somebody that doesn't mean I have all the answers, but being somebody that had our broadcast crew on ABC had Texas four times this past fall. We actually had the game at the end against Texas Tech where he finally played and he drove him down and, 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 and they had a scoring drive. But people who are making those statements haven't, haven't spent the time to watch it. And if they have, they're probably not overly educated on, on what they are watching. Now, you said two things that I think are really important. And they are two things that get glossed over. And that is development, right? Development. And the, for, for me, the performance and the very first performance that we've seen was, was positive. Meaning that if you want to scrutinize him because of his last name and say, well, this guy hasn't done anything yet. Well, number one, he hasn't played yet. So that's wildly unfair. But it's a good sign. I know it's spring football. And I listen, I'll be my first to raise the hand. Spring football is about developing your reserves, developing your younger players, finding out what you have, keeping everybody engaged at all costs, try to avoid the transfer portal, right? And so you're trying to get those moments in those environments for somebody like, like Arch Manning to have a big day, to get some confidence. But when I hear Sart talk about development, see, that's not something we're engaged in anymore. Now it's what can you do for me right now? And I want to play yesterday. I want to start yesterday and just because you are a quarterback or any other position for that matter but it's really i think a, a big part of the quarterback development just because you are a talented quarterback doesn't mean you're ready to play in major college football you have to have so many things aligned in your favor to number one succeed um and to handle that jump that is far more mental and emotional than it is physical all of these kids tech i go to a camp every weekend for the last 20 years, and I can tell you all of them can physically play right away. So that really rarely has anything to do with whether or not you can actually perform to a high standard. So the fact that Arch Manning has been willing to do what he's doing tells you that he sees the big picture. He sees the long view, right? Now, does that mean that because of this performance in the spring game that he could go out on the open market and find a place where he could play right away Because just because – of that spring game? Sure he could. I mean, anything's possible. I mean, this is, this is the transfer portal era. Would that surprise me if he did that? Absolutely it would. Because there are going to – Arch Manning, when his time comes, will be so far greater prepared to succeed than he ever possibly could have been if he chose to go somewhere besides Texas to just try to play right away or if he would jump in the transfer portal in December to just try and play right away. And that's not the approach that he's taking. And there are plenty of examples that we can look at in the National Football League. Steve McNair didn't play right away. Aaron Rodgers didn't play right away. Look at Jordan Love right now. I mean, look at Jordan Love right now. So there are plenty of guys out there that sometimes you look at him and you say, boy, it's really, that guy really had the good fortune of not being thrown to the fire. Is there a comp outside of his family that he reminds you of? Because when I look at him, I see some early Matt Stafford stuff with the arm angles that he likes to work, the release, yeah. kind of the, the ability to navigate the pocket. Again, still early. Wait and see what it looks like when you're actually live and you can take some of those hits. But is there like a name that's come up? And it doesn't just have to be watching him in a spring game, but yeah. that, that you thought of that his game kind of resembles? Uh, yeah, actually the guy at the LA Chargers, uh, Justin Herbert. Now he's not quite as tall as Justin. 
But, and he doesn't have, and very few people have Matthew Stafford's arm, okay? But I will say this, Arch Manning's arm from his senior year in high school to now has changed drastically. He's got more velocity on the ball. He's got more power on the ball. Um, that was something that I would, if, if I was to scrutinize him coming out of high school and say, okay, is there a deficiency? I'd say, okay, well, maybe he's got a good arm, not an elite arm. Now I'd probably say he's trending more towards an elite style arm. But um, the powerful release, the arm angle stuff, the athleticism, I think that's the one thing too, man. Like, no knock on Eli and Peyton, but this guy's different when it comes to athleticism. And they didn't have that. That's a, that's a trait, I think, in the sport of football that is more important now than it has ever been before. You don't have to be Lamar Jackson, but you have got to be able to extend plays, create on your own, meaning you're going to avoid the seven-yard sack, even if it's for a two-yard gain. You know, those are the types of things that Arch Manning can do that his uncles couldn't do. It feels unfair to ask this, but I got to ask it anyways, just because I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering this right now. It is easy to forget that Quinn Ewers was a higher-rated recruit than Arch. Which player do you look at right now and you would say has the higher ceiling just for their college career at Texas? Well, for their college career, probably Arch because of the path that he's taken to eventually get on the field. You know, people fail to realize that Quinn Ewers almost did not play organized football outside of a couple of handoffs at Ohio State for close to two years. Yeah. So there was this expectation because of a recruiting profile that he was going to jump on the field and just light the world on fire. And that was anything there. There was so far off of reality. And Sark would have told you that. Um, I had uh, two Texas games um, two years ago. And the difference between Quinn Ewers in that year one and Quinn Ewers this last year was, I mean, it was night and day. I mean, it's just opposite ends of the spectrum. And so, um, that still means that there's a high ceiling for development for, for Quinn, too. Uh, don't get me wrong, but Quinn was thrust into a situation and into an environment that a lot of kids would not have been able to handle. And to be honest with you, I think there are components that Quinn Ewers did not handle well, which led to his off-season overhaul of his appearance, his habits, his weight room appearance, um, his diet. All of these different things that he went from year one to year two and the light came on and I think he realized if I'm going to be what everybody is saying I'm supposed to be, then I need to make some changes, some personal changes to how I prepare, how I look, what my appearance is, how I outwardly look amongst my teammates, what my body language is like. That's night and day from year one to year two as well. But I don't know if Arch will ever have to go through that part of it because it's been such a, like, here's, here's the curve for Quinn, right? This is the curve for Arch, right? And that's two entirely different worlds you're living in. Be honest, the, the broadcast, when you guys, you guys had four Texas games, the, there was always going to be that priority in the production room of, hey, we got to get the Quinn Ewers, the, the, the arc his entire storyline. We got to work this into the oh, game yeah. conversation, the way he lost stuff. It was every single game that he yeah. played. And I get it because when you're that decorated as a recruit and you look the way that he does and you're playing in this high profile program, I get it. But it is yeah. funny that that was brought up ad nauseum. By the end of the season, you're like, tell me about his in-season changes because right. I've heard so much about this offseason. So. Well, I, I'll listen, I'll be the first one to say, and I was very critical of him last offseason, and here was why. He's got this – he has a personality that I think can work for you and work against you. So he's got this very calm, easygoing, laid-back demeanor almost at all times. You don't see a lot of fieriness. You don't see a lot of up-and-down emotion stuff from him. The problem is, or it can be, and I think it was his first year, is when you have that personality – and things aren't going well, it can come off as bad body language. When things are going well, it, you look like you have ice water in your veins, right? Nothing phases you. This is easy. Bing, bing, boom. We're going to pitch and catch here, this and that. But I remember standing on the sideline in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And Texas was playing Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma State is playing better than Texas, performing better than Texas. Ended up winning the game. And the worse the game went for Texas, 
the worst of body language was on that day for Quinn Ewers. But it wasn't that he changed his body language. It was what was happening in the game reflected as if it was um, kind of like a, a ho-hum kind of oh well type of thing. And I don't think he means to do that. You can go back through the first three to four weeks of the season. You can look at the Alabama game and watch Quinn Ewers on the sideline. He's fiery. He's got some um, edge to him. He's vocal. Nobody's ever. How many people before this last season could ever raise their hand and say they've actually heard Quinn Ewers' voice? That's a good point. Right? So, but you got a little bit of that. So I think he looked at himself too and he watched himself and he realized. I have to carry myself different. If I'm going to lead this team and I'm going to be the voice and I'm going to be the guy that's the face of this thing, then it's it's got to be better than it's been. And he, to his credit, man, he deserves a ton of it. He went out and did it. It feels like he was at the beginning of this wave where things really started to shift in recruiting with like reclassifying, having NIL come into play pretty early during that process. Yeah, oh yeah. How much have things changed with the way that you cover recruiting in these last three years compared to even by the previous 20 years of covering recruiting? Oh, it's uh, you can't even compare the two, Connor. I mean, it's um, and that doesn't mean it's all bad. Doesn't mean it's all bad, but much of it is because we we are so far removed, so far removed from what college football or basketball, whatever sport you want to want to throw out there that's affected by name, image, and likeness in the transfer portal. We're so far removed from player development, the team focus, the environment of the program, playing for a championship, playing for a college football playoff berth. These kids and their parents, and, and, and I'm not saying all of them. I don't want to generalize everybody, but I can just tell you this. I never heard any of these things until two years ago, and that is, what can you pay me? What is the NIL package? Nobody's asking any questions about the, the scheme. How do I fit? Can I be a mid-year enrollee? What could my role be? Um, I want to major in this. Nobody cares about any of that stuff. We're so far removed from that. And the problem is, is the narrow focus of the transfer portal and name, image, and likeness and everybody wanting that immediate gratification has put, I think, a lot of people – into a position to make a very, very bad decision. And so I'll give you a, a prime example. We are seeing now kids sign for no other reason than what type of NIL package, all right? So then they arrive on campus. It's really hard. They're not the big shot anymore. Nobody's walking them around and parading them around telling them how great they are. They're probably getting their butt kicked a little bit on the field or in the weight room, all right? So now it's shell shock. That coach that was patting them on the back telling how great they are, he's now de-recruiting that player. I call it the de-recruitment phase, and it happens to all of us, right? So now all of a sudden that nice guy, he's cussing at me in a drill, or he's on my ass. And now what happens is the first inclination is, well, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. I'm going somewhere else. Because you didn't sign on to that program for any of the reasons that should have been involved in the decision, right? You did it for one reason. And all of a sudden, everything else around that gets hard. You're not an employee. So, like, they can't sign you to a contract. You have all the freedoms in the world. You don't have to perform to earn your name, image, and likeness, Connor. That's the other embarrassing part about all of this, is we're creating an environment and an atmosphere of no accountability whatsoever. Like, if you and I went out and we had a job and we got paid a salary to do the job, if we don't do the job, guess what happens? We get fired. Well, because they're not employees, and we're going to pay them X, Y, and Z, and they decide, eh, I'm going to transfer somewhere else, they're still getting that money. There's no, there's no accountability. <clears throat> and if I hear one more person say this, oh, well, the coaches can leave whenever they want. The, the, the players can leave whenever they want. Well, I've just watched Caden Proctor. Penny Boone at Toledo and now Louisville, which will then be a third coming up. So Alabama, again, will be the third for Caden Proctor. Okay, I dare anybody to name me one head football coach in college football. One. I'll give you the last 20 years that has taken three jobs in 18 months. Gosh, because even the one and dones, like Drink spent one year at 
Appalachian State or Arkansas State had all those runs where it was like the future Auburn coach was going to spend that one year there, you know, right. at Gus Malzahn. Right. But in an 18 month stretch, yeah, you're right. It's it is extremely rare, and it so is something Gus, where yeah, you like can't Gus make that comp. From, so so um, uh, Pew Freed at Arkansas State. All right, he leads and goes on to become the head coach at Ole Miss, and then he's at Ole Miss until they let him go. Gus Malzahn is at Auburn until they let him go. My point is, is we keep talking about these player freedoms, but there's no accountability on the side of the player, yet we act like they're the same as the, as the coach. And I want somebody to point out to me who has done as a head football coach in major college football what Penny Boone is about to do by the end of this next two-week period. Go from Toledo to Louisville to somewhere else. That's not what any of this was intended to be, ever. What's your ideal fix? Because obviously there is so much talk about unionization, what it would look like for employees, but what's the, the, the easiest fix for you that you can look at at this sport that would have a drastic improvement uh, on it as a whole? Well, I, a couple of things, and, and, they, and both of them start and revolve around what is the biggest problem in college athletics right now. It's not the transfer portal. It's not name, image, and likeness. It's tampering. That's the biggest problem in college athletics right now. Anybody who says it's not is naive, they're uninformed, um, or they're not in that profession, okay? You add the poison of name, image, and likeness and the transfer portal together, coupled with tampering, and now we have a huge, huge problem. So first and foremost, there has to be some way of governing policing, but moreover, uh, penalizing to a severity that nobody would ever even consider tampering with another team's player. You try to do that in the NFL, you know what's happening? You're in serious, serious trouble, right? Right now, everybody just looks the other way. It starts there. Secondly, um, I think from a, a name, image, and likeness perspective, Nick Saban was going down a path. He got criticized for it. He's not wrong. But there has to be, I think, some form of revenue. If we're going to make them employees, doesn't mean you got to unionize them. But if we're going to make them employees, which is exactly what's going to have to happen, then we would have some type of trickle-down revenue share. And you'd have to have it scaled and tiered because, you know, obviously men's basketball or football, what have you, is going to bring in a lot more money than, you know, women's golf or men's swimming, what have you. So there would have to be a scale on it. Um, you, you revenue share. And then you individually let players go out. And if their value is dictated on the open market, that they can earn more than that through name, image, and likeness, by all means, allow them to do so. I think the coaches, I've not talked to one coach, Connor, not one that is anti-transfer if we had rules and stipulations and guidelines on it. And I haven't talked to one that's anti-name, image, and likeness. But you talk to all of them and you talk about those two things together, along with tampering, they got a big problem with that. And, and, I, don't bl and I don't blame them. So, you know, I, I think that, that that is something that uh, they're going to have to become employees because it's the only way to stay out of court. It's the only way to vo avoid antitrust stuff. The transfer portal part from a collective bargaining agreement is how we get to an answer in the transfer portal, meaning that the university, okay, is going to have to give. The player side would have to give. We would have to sign these players to contracts. They would be required to perform under those contracts. You wouldn't be skipping games. You wouldn't be skipping a bowl game. You see any NFL guys when uh, their, their team is uh, out of playoff contention with four weeks left in the season? Do the UC NFL guys just walk onto the street and not play anymore? You know why they don't? They're not allowed to because they have a collectively bargained situation with the league. And so I think – from a transfer portal perspective, and it, it often gets to gets referred to as a you know a reflection of the NFL free agency period. The difference is you have one free agency period. So for a calendar year, all right, at least those NFL teams know who's on their roster, right? And they have length of terms of contracts for who's on that roster. And then when the next period comes up, they know exactly where they stand. That's not what we're doing in college football right now. We're basically saying if we were in, if we took the same model we have in college football and you added it to the NFL, can you, how in the world would the Green Bay Packers 
compete against the Dallas Cowboys in free agency if every single player could go anywhere they wanted every single year? Because that's what we have in college football right now. So that, imagine that insanity in professional football with ownerships that might be have a much bigger standing than an ownership in this small market or what have you. That's how that whole thing survives. It's revenue sharing. So, but when you start to discuss it in those terms and you start to realize, and we're dealing with bigger rosters in college football than the NFL is. We're dealing with more teams than the NFL is. So there has to, the, 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 the making them employees and the ability to collectively bargain is the first path we have to go down because that's the only way that we put any type of guardrails on this thing, and there would be accountability on both sides. A guy that's become uh, one of the unfortunate faces of this, and especially now that he entered the transfer portal as of right now, we don't have any clarification on where he's going to end up, though there's been speculation that Georgia could be the front runner. Jaden Rashad's career as a whole just kind of feels like, it feels like a bummer that would have played out differently six years ago, and I shouldn't say played out because obviously this is somebody who just finished his true freshman season, but all the things that are kind of said about him, some of which he's brought upon himself, some of yeah. which are just, it just comes with the territory when you make the decisions that he did. But what do you kind of make of the way that things have played out for him so far? I think he's the poster child right now for what's wrong. And when you are, you put yourself in a public position where you've acknowledged that name, image, and likeness is essentially your primary focus. Because we're also talking about a player that prior to injury was the starting quarterback as a true freshman for Arizona State. Okay. Now I understand Arizona State's not playing with the same deck of cards that Georgia is in name, image, and likeness. I get that. And I understand that he gets it too. But if I'm a coach at another school, and I know it's the premium position on the market, I get that. And I know he's talented. We had him in the Under Armour All America game. Trust me, I know he's talented. But if I'm a coach at another school, I could care less about what he can do physically. The number one question that I'm asking is, can I trust this guy? Can I trust this guy to care about the locker room, to care about the team, to be the best version of himself, to commit to a program, all right? Forget the name, image, and likeness. Forget the fallen through deals that, you know, we all heard about with, with Florida and, you know, him decommitting from Miami and, and then he ends up at Arizona State. Now he's going to go on the open market again. You have to start asking questions that everybody wants to criticize if you ask them. But how do you not ask those questions if you're responsible as a program for putting the best 22 players on the field each and every week? And you're talking about a quarterback who's got a decommitment in high school, uh, another one from um, uh, Florida, then to Arizona State, now Arizona State to we don't know where. And so I think the, the downside in all of this is eventually this is going to start catching up with these guys. It's going to catch up with a Penny Boone. Probably he's not going to catch up with a, a Caden Proctor because he's played a lot of football. He also plays a premium position, so he's given a longer leash. Doesn't mean it's right. But we're seeing a lot of these players, and in, in, in they're doing this. And I, I think the message here, Connor, is everybody thinks that if they go into the transfer portal – and let's just say you you signed for zero money on a name, image, and likeness deal, all right? Or you signed for $200,000. I don't care if it's zero or $200,000. When you go to that next school, you can't be under the assumption that they're just going to hand you the job on a platter. Like you can't, if I'm Penny Boone and my, my, my final three schools were Kentucky, Florida State, and Louisville. And I've, and I've taken visits, and I've seen the running back room. And, okay, I've got name, image, and likeness choices amongst all those guys. All right, I choose Louisville. You're there for four months. And now all of a sudden, maybe you're not that best running back in that room. Maybe all of a sudden it's really hard. You're not being treated special. And the fact that you ran for 1,700 or 1,400 yards or whatever it was at Toledo last year where the MAC Offensive Player of the Year doesn't matter at Louisville. You know what? It wouldn't have mattered at Florida State, and it wouldn't have mattered at Kentucky. And guess what those two schools did, Connor, when he signed with Louisville? Kentucky went out and got Chip Tranium. Florida State went out and got Roydell Williams. Replaced them in the blink of an eye, like that. So now you're asking the same question about Penny Boone that you've got to ask about Jaden Rashada. Because 
Now I'm asking myself, well, what's wrong at Louisville? Was, was it too much of a step up in level of competition? Um, was it not what he expected? At some point or another, there, you have to accept the fact that it's going to be hard. You're going to be challenged. And you're not going to be handed anything. And if you think by going into the portal and going somewhere else, you are going to be handed something, you're delusional. That, that's the thing. Sooner or later, the player has to say, I, um, I got to do my job. Whatever that Fair job enough. is, I got to do my job. That's just straight out of the Belichick playbook right there. <laughs> just do your job. Do your job. Yeah, Everything takes care of it. It's crazy. And, and, well, that's the biggest thing with name, image, and likeness, especially for in college guys. Forget the recruiting guys, but guys that are in college. If you perform, name, image, and likeness takes care of itself. True. Yeah. Because performance dictates value. Value dictates your spot in the market. Well, if you don't create value because you're not performing, why should you expect name, image, and likeness money? Fair point. No reason to. Absolutely none at this no. point. But weird world that we are that we are living in. It is in a that. weird world, dude. <laughs> Man, tough to navigate. Uh, last well, one for you. Um, yeah. I, I've, I've always been curious about this with people that work sideline during games and stuff. We've had no shortage of, uh, of sideline reporters, sideline analysts that, that have provided some perspective on this. What's the craziest thing that you've witnessed I, like just while you're on a broadcast okay. that you've seen on the sideline that you couldn't report on? Like a story that you're just like, I just saw something happen there. I can't, I can't be like, hey, producer, get me on to, to talk about this. But something that you had to like keep under wraps that just kind of blew you away. Um, you know, I got to be honest with you. I spent 10 years on that sideline in an analyst role. And um, there's really only one instance that comes to mind when you ask that question. And it was the Oklahoma-Kansas game with Baker Mayfield grabbing his, his do you remember that okay <laughs> who could forget it <laughs> exactly well so here's the thing what people never saw because nobody caught it until he got to the sideline was what baker mayfield was doing from the moment he threw the touchdown and coming all the way back over to his sideline it was way worse than what he actually got caught doing on tv so here was what we talked about on that broadcast. And uh, so if you're looking at it from the TV view, the Oklahoma offense was going left to right. And Oklahoma's on the opposite, on the opposite sideline. So Baker Mayfield, if I remember, he rolls out and he throws a touchdown pass. So he's kind of fading off towards the Kansas sideline. But you're the quarterback in Oklahoma. You are a Heisman Trophy candidate you got to have some awareness man you have to know where the camera is going to be like you 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 assume the camera's on you right well i can't remember and it's probably why it didn't make air i don't think we had sky cam that day and this was a while ago i could be off but i don't think we, so we had meaning we'd have fewer cameras to actually catch it so I'm on the Oklahoma sideline when he's coming. I'm watching the entire thing, and we got a button on our microphone. So you press this button, and the, then I can talk to our production truck, and my voice goes off air. If I don't press the button and I talk, my voice goes on air. So I press the button. I'm like, guys, are you getting this? Because I'm watching it, and by the time we got around to it is what actually made air. But it was, it was deeper than that. So – Post game, and the the uh, the SID, the sports information director at Oklahoma, his name is Mike Hauk. Well, it gets to him real quick. <laughs> what happened? So, of course, I have to ask the question. I the, I know the answer is no, but I have to say, can we get Baker post game? And he looks at me like I had three heads. <laughs> well, the problem in all of this is Lincoln Riley has no idea any of this happened. Oh. So I get Lincoln post handshake and I I pull him aside, I just whisper in his ear and I said, "Listen. I got to ask you about something that you probably don't know took place. But you have an incident with Baker. I don't want you to be blindsided because you don't know what I'm talking about, so we both look like dummies on live television. And you can respond any way you want, but just know when you go in that locker room, you're going to have something to deal with." 
And he goes, all right, man, appreciate it. Appreciate you looking out for me. So, and that's exactly kind of what happened. So I asked him about it. He goes, I'm not aware of it. I'll have to look into it, you know, after the game, blah, 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 blah. But um, I, I had one instance with Jimbo Fisher at Florida State. It was actually kind of funny. Um, Cause I know a lot of these guys through recruiting long before I was ever doing, you know, games and they, it was Jameis Winston's year playing Maryland in Tallahassee. And they're like, you know, the coaches can't come out of that box 25 yard line. Well, it's 20 now, but it was 25 then. And I'm down They're in red area and they're about to score. And he thinks they got a first down and the, and the ball, the, you know, it's really close. Like it's, it's super close, but he can't see it. So he comes to the edge of the box and he's screaming at me, Tommy, 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 did we get it? Did we get it? Did we get the first down? And I'm standing over leaning at him. I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll have instances like that. Like I had time one time at Texas A&M. Mark Snyder was the defensive coordinator and they're playing Rice, I think. Kevin Sumlin was at, still at A&M and they're getting gashed on defense. And I happened to go to grad school at Marshall. He was the head coach at Marshall, so I've known him for a little while. And I just went up to him. I was like, you're getting hammered in you between the tackles, man. Because I know, he goes, I got to get out of it. I said, I said, and I asked him, I was like, why are you just standing everybody up in gaps? Line up, get down to your front and play. And this is during the game, right? <laughs> the offense is on the field. And I got him at the other edge of the box. And he... He goes, we got to stop screwing around. I got to do, we just got to line up. Uh, we're thinking too much. So for me, it was fantastic because I, you know, I wasn't breaking any code. I wasn't, you know, breaking any trust, but I was able to hit my producer up and say, dude, I just talked to the defensive coordinator in the middle of the series. Let's go. And so they toss it down to me and I was able to give the back and forth exchange. And the very next series, they're lined up in a four man front. <laughs> so you can be a defensive a coordinator. Yeah, I have more, like, fun little, like, nuggets and stories like that. Um, I haven't, I mean, aside from, you know, kids getting undressed and just getting, you know, roasted by coaches yeah. or, you know, getting laid into and ripped, you know, I don't I don't have a ton of, like, wacky things. I mean, I've had a couple, I've had several field rush moments that are pretty crazy. I mean, the one at Duke on Labor Day weekend this past season with, with Clemson. Yep. Con- Connor, I've never... There was three minutes and 13 seconds left to go in the game, and they let all of those students on the field, and not one of them, not one of them acted drunk, not one of them stepped one foot onto that field, not a single one of them was a problem. It was like, no wonder these are all the smart kids, right? I'm looking around, I'm going, I mean, you would have thought, if you do that, you're asking for trouble, right? Well, then I start looking around, and I'm going, it, it starts to dawn on me, I got to get to this handshake. And usually when they rush the field, I got a head start. They haven't left the stadium yet. They're standing like right here, right behind me. All of them, probably 12,000 of them. And uh, so that was probably my most exciting time was that rush onto the field and getting that handshake and actually having to physically out sprint kids and other players. Which you did. I remember Which seeing I that and immediately. I actually had to throw a couple people around too. I wasn't messing around. <laughs> Nor should you. It's look. It's by any means necessary in those in absolutely. those scrubs. You just no, you just no. absolutely have to. I I'm going to be thinking forever about about what Baker did. I'll, I'll get I'll get you offline here about what Baker did in those moments beforehand. Probably not safe for a PG PG thirteen uh, type audience. That's that's incredible, man. Oh yeah, really no, stuff. it wouldn't be. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tom, really, really appreciate it. Um, best sure. of luck with everything you got going on. And uh, yeah, when the summer football league starts, I'm sure we'll get you on and talk about that too. Yeah, yeah, I'll be on that too. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.